On the afternoon of May 29, 1993, 32-year-old Norma Rodriguez stood over a grill flipping hamburgers in her backyard in Port Hunami, California. Norma had long brown wavy hair, and she was wearing a light colorful dress. It was Memorial Day weekend, and Norma had invited over a bunch of her friends and co-workers from the retail store where she worked to celebrate the holiday. Music was playing, the smell of food wafted through the backyard, and the weather felt perfect at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Norma smiled as she watched her youngest son, who was four years old, running around the yard with a few of her friend's kids, and she thought to herself that she couldn't have asked for a better day to host a party. Norma checked the burgers on the grill and then shouted out to the guests that the food was ready. Then she put the burgers on a tray and put it down on a long picnic table next to paper plates, side dishes, and condiments that she'd already laid out. Then she just stepped back and watched as her friends continued talking, laughing, and walking over to the table to get their food. And as she watched them, she was reminded of all the family cookouts she had had when she was a kid. Norma came from a big family. She had six sisters and a brother, and she still enjoyed having her house filled with people. A friend of Norma's, Warren Mackey, walked over to her with his plate of food in his hand. He thanked Norma for the burger and for inviting him to the party. Warren and Norma had worked together for a while, but even after Warren had left the job, they stayed in touch. Because Norma was one of those people who made friends for life. In fact, she was still close with people she'd known in college and in high school, and she made it a point to still talk to them as often as she could. Warren took a bite of his hamburger, and then he told Norma that he'd noticed the rim on the basketball hoop in her driveway was bent forward, and he said he'd be happy to fix it right now if Norma wanted him to, and Norma said that would be great. She knew her oldest son would be very excited when he got home, and he saw the basketball hoop that he loved was now fixed. Norma lived in a small one-story house in Port Hanami with her 4-year-old and 11-year-old boys. She had met the boy's father, Anthony Rodriguez, when she was in college and they had married a couple of years later and started their family. Norma and Anthony's relationship had looked perfect from the outside. They seemed happy together, and they had these two beautiful sons. But despite the appearance of how they looked, internally, their relationship was kind of a mess. Anthony spent a ton of time away from the house, either working or just hanging out with his brother. So Norma had often felt like she and the boys were just not a priority for Anthony. And the longer they had stayed together, the worse the relationship got, and soon they were fighting all the time. And so, two years before this Memorial Day party, Norma had finally had enough, and she had divorced Anthony. As a single mom, Norma spent all of her time making sure she was providing for and taking care of her sons. She put in long hours at the retail store where she worked to earn extra money, but she also tried really hard to spend as much time as she could with the boys. She made it a point to help her oldest with his homework, and she always tried to be home to make the boys dinner and to help her youngest get ready for bed every night. It wasn't easy, but Norma never worried about how busy or tired she was. As long as her sons were okay, she was too. Norma also tried to remain friends with her ex-husband, Anthony, really just for her son's sake. She'd even let her oldest son miss the backyard cookout that day just so he could go to a baseball game with his dad and his uncle. And so, for the most part, Norma was happy on her own with her kids. But there were times, like when her son's basketball hoop broke, that she missed having someone else in her life to help her manage everything. But the few times she dated since the divorce had not led to anything long-term, and Norma was just really picky about who she let into her and her son's lives. And so, she was appreciative of friends like Warren, who would pitch in and help her from time to time. After Warren had very quickly fixed the basketball hoop, Norma had thanked him profusely, and then she walked over to talk to one of her other friends named Beatrice. The two women had met at work, and they had hit it off right away. Beatrice was having problems in her marriage, and so she felt like Norma was one of the only people she could actually talk to about it because of Norma's experience with her own divorce. Norma asked Beatrice if she was doing okay, and Beatrice would say that, you know, things are about the same, and then Beatrice would ask Norma how she was doing, and Norma would say that, you know, life was great, Except that lately, her ex-husband, Anthony, had started showing up at their house totally unannounced. Norma didn't mind letting her oldest son spend more time with Anthony than Anthony was actually allotted in their custody agreement to go see a baseball game or to spend an extra weekend with him. But Norma was not okay with Anthony coming to the house whenever he wanted, like he still lived there. Beatrice asked Norma if Anthony had tried to sleep with her again, like maybe he wanted to rekindle things. But Norma said no, he usually just came into the house, talked for a minute, and then sat down on the couch and watched TV. 
and if Norma tried to ask him to leave, he would just get mad. One of Norma's sisters, who lived nearby, had told her to just stop letting Anthony into the house at all, and Beatrice said she agreed with Norma's sister. Norma had to draw boundaries. But Norma worried that keeping Anthony out of the house would upset the boys, and that was the last thing she wanted. She knew her sons loved their dad, especially her oldest son, who shared a lot of interests with Anthony. And so her oldest son liked to hang out with his dad and talk about baseball and basketball and other things that Norma just didn't really know much about. Beatrice and Norma talked a bit longer about the whole situation, and then Norma walked around the backyard and checked in with her other guests to see if they needed anything. Norma's Memorial Day cookout lasted for hours. Some people stuck around until long after the sun had set to spend some more time with Norma and to help her clean up. Eventually, when the last guest had left, Norma picked up her four-year-old son, who was still running around outside, and she began carrying him towards the house. Before she went inside, she turned and looked over at the now-fixed basketball hoop and smiled, thinking about how nice it was that Warren had done that. Norma went inside and made her way to her son's room, where she tucked him into his bed and said goodnight. Then she walked into her own bedroom and got changed into a t-shirt and a pair of comfortable shorts. She went to the living room at the front of the house and then sat down on the couch to watch TV. On most nights, Norma found it a lot easier to fall asleep on the couch watching TV than she did falling asleep in her own bed. And this night was no different. A few minutes after finding something to watch, Norma felt her eyes getting heavy and so she stretched out on the couch and with the sound of the TV playing in the background, she drifted off to sleep. 24 hours later, at about 10.30 p.m. on May 30th, Norma walked down the hall towards her four-year-old son's bedroom. She opened the door quietly, looked in, and saw him sound asleep in his bed. Norma knew he was still totally worn out from the barbecue the day before. Norma had spent that day cleaning up the house a bit and watching movies with her four-year-old. Her oldest son was still staying with her ex-husband, Anthony, and he wouldn't be home until the following night. So the house felt quiet and a little empty. Eventually, Norma went to the living room, turned on the TV, and stretched out on the couch like she had done the night before, and within a few minutes, she had drifted off to sleep. The next day, at 9.45 p.m. on May 31st, so 48 hours after the barbecue, Norma's 11-year-old son stepped out of Anthony's car in front of the house. The boy said goodbye to his father and to his uncle, who was also in the car. Then he walked up to the front door of the house as they drove away. The boy grabbed the doorknob, but the door was locked. So he knocked on the door and waited, but nobody answered. Then he knocked again, but there still was no answer. The boy figured his mom had just fallen asleep on the couch like she usually did, and so he looked out to the street to see if maybe his dad was still nearby and could help him wake up his mom. But his dad was gone. So the boy walked around to the side of the house to his open bedroom window. Norma liked to keep the windows open when it was nice out in the summer. The boy leaned in close to the window and pulled off the screen and put it on the ground. Then he grabbed the actual window and raised it higher and then climbed inside. But when he got into his room, he almost screamed. He was startled because his four-year-old younger brother was just sitting there in the middle of his room. The 11-year-old caught his breath and then asked his little brother why he wasn't in his bed. The four-year-old just looked at him and then pointed at the door leading into the bedroom and said, Mommy has a Band-Aid on her face. The 11-year-old looked at his little brother for a second, totally confused, but then he figured his little brother was just tired and not making any sense, or that his mom maybe had cut her cheek or something and had put a Band-Aid on the cut. Either way, the 11-year-old didn't want to wake up his mom if she was sleeping, so he walked his little brother to his own room and tucked him in. Then the 11-year-old went back to his room, changed into pajamas, and went to bed as well. The following morning, so June 1st, at around 7.30 a.m., Norma's ex-husband, Anthony, pulled his car up in front of their house again. Anthony and his brother got out of the car and walked up to the front door. Anthony was 33 years old, and he was tall with dark hair and dark eyes. He knocked on the door, and then he and his brother stood on the porch and talked while they waited for Norma to answer. Anthony and his brother were there to take the boys for the day because Norma had made plans to go to the beach with some of her friends. <laughs> 
After a few moments had passed and Norma had not come to the door, Anthony knocked again. And when nobody answered again, he said he was worried something weird was going on. Norma knew he was coming over, and even when she fell asleep on the couch, she always woke up early in the morning. Anthony pounded on the door again, and again when nobody answered, he reached into his pocket, pulled out his wallet, and then grabbed a credit card that was inside of it. Then he slipped the credit card into the crack between the door and the frame right under the lock. He shook the card up and down against the lock a few times, and then just like that, the lock gave way. As soon as this happened, Anthony looked back at his brother with a smile on his face, and his brother clearly was impressed that Anthony was able to do that. Anthony then opened the door and walked into the living room, and he was about to call out to Norma, but then he saw something and just froze. Then Anthony turned back to his brother and yelled for him to give him the knife that Anthony knew his brother always carried. His brother grabbed the knife out of his pocket and handed it over. Anthony took the knife and ran across the living room and got down on the floor. And his brother saw him cutting something with the knife, but he couldn't see exactly what was going on. Then, just as quickly as Anthony had done that, he stood up and ran into the kitchen and called 911. A few minutes after Anthony called 911, Detective Tony Paradise walked through the small Port Hanami Police Department, drinking a fresh cup of coffee. His phone was ringing at his desk, so he sat down and answered it. On the other line, a 911 dispatcher said they'd just gotten a call about a potential homicide. Paradise hung up the phone, and he thought somebody was playing a prank on him. That day was literally Paradise's first day on the job. He'd just transferred over from a station in Los Angeles, and he knew that Port Hanami had a very low crime rate, and that the small local police force had not dealt with a reported homicide case in close to three years. So Paradise thought the phone call might just be the other cops kind of hazing the new guy. Paradise got up and walked over to the desk of lead detective Dennis Fitzgerald to see if he was really being pranked. But Fitzgerald said there was no way that call was a joke. So Fitzgerald, Paradise, and several other officers headed outside, got into their cars, and drove a few minutes across town to Norma's house. Paradise parked his car in front of the house behind Fitzgerald's and then stepped outside. Paramedics were already there, and a uniformed officer was standing outside with Anthony, his brother, and Norma's two young sons. And Paradise saw at least a few of Norma's neighbors standing on their porches trying to see what was going on. Paradise still couldn't believe this was how he was spending his first day as a Port Hunami detective. He thought Port Hunami was the type of place people moved to so they could feel safe a place where they could escape to the beach and leave their windows open at night without worrying about anything. Detective Fitzgerald waved Paradise over. Fitzgerald was 49 years old. He was average height, and he had thinning hair and a mustache. The detectives headed up the walkway towards the front door, while other officers started to block off the scene with police tape. The front door was open, so Paradise and Fitzgerald just walked right into the living room and put on their gloves. Then, both detectives walked across the room towards the kitchen, and when they saw what was on the floor, they felt like they'd walked into a scene from a horror movie. A woman's dead body was lying there. It was Norma, and her face and head were completely wrapped in duct tape. Fitzgerald and Paradise crouched down to get a closer look at the victim. A small piece of the duct tape had been cut away from her nose and mouth, and there was a set of house keys lying on the floor next to her. The detectives also noticed that rigor mortis had already started to set in, which causes the body to stiffen after death. But inside of a controlled environment, like this suburban living room, rigor mortis usually takes several hours to appear in the arms and legs. So Fitzgerald and Paradise believed the victim had most likely been dead in the house since sometime the day before. Fitzgerald and Paradise stood up and searched the living room. There was no blood anywhere, no weapon, and no sign of forced entry. So Fitzgerald wondered if maybe Norma had come home with the killer and still had her keys in her hand when she was attacked. While the detectives did a full search of the house, the forensics team arrived. They started to take DNA samples from Norma's body, using sweat from her hands, fingernail clippings, and samples from the duct tape wrapped around her head. In 1993, DNA testing was still a relatively new investigative technique. Large samples of DNA were required to get any useful results, and the testing process took a really long time. 
so investigators knew they should not expect a fast turnaround with any of these samples. During their search of the house, Fitzgerald and Paradise didn't find anything that had been disturbed in either of the boys' bedrooms or in Norma's bedroom. So they walked back outside and pulled Anthony down the walkway to talk to him while Norma's son stayed with their uncle and another officer. Anthony confirmed that the dead woman inside the house was his ex-wife, Norma Rodriguez. And Fitzgerald told Anthony they would need him and his brother to come to the station to answer some questions. Anthony said he understood and then walked back over to his sons. A little later, as Fitzgerald drove away from the house back to the station, he couldn't get the image of Norma out of his mind. There was something about wrapping duct tape around her face and head that felt so personal and invasive to Fitzgerald. So he was convinced whoever had done it must have known Norma intimately, and Fitzgerald thought that all of the initial signs pointed to Norma's ex-husband, Anthony. Shortly after Detective Fitzgerald went back to the Port Hunami police station, he sat down with Anthony inside of an interrogation room. The room was bright, cold, and cramped, and Anthony knew that Fitzgerald did not just want to have a casual conversation with him. Anthony was sure the police had targeted him as a suspect from the moment they showed up at the house. After all, he was the ex-husband, and he was the one who had found Norma's body. Anthony's brother had also been brought to the station for questioning, and Norma's sons were there too. Fitzgerald needed to talk to the boys, but he knew they were scared and still in shock. So he wanted to make sure they were physically and mentally okay before he talked to them about what had happened to their mother. In the interrogation room, Fitzgerald asked Anthony to start by explaining what had happened earlier that morning when Anthony had arrived at his ex-wife's house. And Anthony told Fitzgerald how when nobody had answered the door, he had unlocked it using a credit card. Fitzgerald sat straight up in his chair. This was a huge red flag and Fitzgerald had a couple of different thoughts running through his head. Did this guy have experience breaking into houses? Or had Anthony just used the key to get in, and he was making up the credit card story to cover his tracks? The police had found a set of house keys next to Norma's body on the floor, and there was no sign of forced entry. So Fitzgerald believed there was a good chance whoever killed Norma had been invited into the house, and he knew Anthony was a frequent visitor there. Anthony could have easily killed Norma, taken the keys, used them to get back into the house the following day, and then put the keys on the floor by Norma's body before the police arrived. But Fitzgerald didn't want to show his hand in any way, so he let Anthony keep talking. And Fitzgerald spotted yet another huge red flag almost immediately. Anthony said when he walked into the house, he saw Norma lying on the floor between the living room and the kitchen, and her head and face were completely wrapped in duct tape. And so he said his first instinct was to cut the tape away so Norma could breathe. So Anthony got a utility knife from his brother that had a fold-out pair of scissors on it, and he had rushed over to Norma and cut the duct tape away from her mouth and nose. He said her body still felt warm when he was touching her, but she wasn't breathing. So he ran into the kitchen and called 911. Fitzgerald leaned back and just kind of stared at Anthony in disbelief. In Fitzgerald's mind, Anthony was admitting to tampering with evidence at a murder scene. And the idea that Anthony thought Norma's body was still warm didn't seem possible to Fitzgerald. He knew Norma had been dead since the day before Anthony and his brother showed up at the house, so her body definitely would not have been warm. It would have been cold. But Fitzgerald knew that people could experience different things and make strange decisions when they were in shock. So even though everything about Anthony's story felt totally off to Fitzgerald, he stayed open to the idea that Anthony could be telling the truth. Fitzgerald asked Anthony if he would stay at the station and submit to a polygraph, which is commonly known as a lie detector test. Anthony said he would, and he also agreed to submit DNA samples for testing. While Anthony was prepped for his polygraph, Fitzgerald stepped out of the interrogation room and met with the investigators who had been speaking with Anthony's brother. And it would turn out both men had given identical stories of what had happened. But that didn't really mean anything to Fitzgerald. Anthony and his brother could have easily worked out a story together before they called 911. Later that day, Norma's ex-husband Anthony sat through a polygraph test and he passed. So as far as that test was concerned, Anthony was telling the truth about the events of the morning, which meant he was telling the truth about not killing Norma. <laughs> 
Not long after Anthony had taken his polygraph, Fitzgerald and Paradise walked into an office in the police station where Norma's sons had been waiting with an officer and a child welfare social worker. Fitzgerald crouched down in front of the chair where Norma's four-year-old son was sitting, and he introduced himself in a soft, calm voice. The little boy was scared and confused, and he barely spoke. So, his 11-year-old brother stepped in to try to help police as best as he could. He told detectives about how his dad and uncle had dropped him off at home the night before, and how he had missed the Memorial Day cookout at the house. Then, the 11-year-old told them that, you know, the front door was locked when he got home, and so he'd gone in through his bedroom window, and that was when he found his little brother just sitting there in the middle of the room. He said he didn't want to wake up his mom, so he tucked his younger brother into bed, and then went back to his own room and fell asleep. But then, the 11-year-old remembered something else. He told police that when he first climbed into his bedroom, his little brother had said something really weird. He said, Mommy has a Band-Aid on her face. At that moment, something hit Fitzgerald in paradise for the first time. They realized that Norma's four-year-old son had been alone in the house with the body of his dead mother for hours. And the little boy couldn't understand what the duct tape covering his mother's face was, so he had told his older brother that their mom had a Band-Aid on her face. Fitzgerald and Paradise tried not to react in front of the boys, but nothing they had seen in their time as cops had ever hit them as hard as that image of this poor little boy just alone with his dead mother not having any idea what had happened. Fitzgerald thanked both of the boys for talking to them, and he told them that the police were there to help them if they needed anything. Then he and Paradise walked out of the office, and Fitzgerald sat down at his desk and tried to collect himself. He had kids of his own, and he struggled to imagine how anyone their age or younger could go through what Norma's little boy had gone through. On June 2nd, so the day after Norma's body had been discovered, Fitzgerald and Paradise got Norma's autopsy results, and those results caused them to fixate on the duct tape even more. It turned out the killer had used 20 feet of duct tape to completely cover Norma's face and head. The detectives were stunned by the amount of time that must have taken. And their initial thought after seeing the autopsy results was that whoever had killed Norma had immediately wanted to kind of distance themselves from her. So they had used the tape to depersonalize her and make her someone kind of faceless. This theory supported Fitzgerald's first impression that the killer must have known Norma well. And so after the murder, they couldn't admit to themselves that they had killed someone so close to them. But Norma's ex-husband, Anthony, who really seemed like the best suspect, had passed his polygraph. That didn't mean the police would rule him out as a suspect, but they needed to meet with other people who were also close to Norma. And they wanted to start by focusing on Norma's friends who had recently been at her house for that cookout. In the week following Norma's murder, the investigative team tracked down everyone who had attended Norma's Memorial Day cookout the day before she was murdered. And one of the first people they brought into the station to talk to was Warren Mackey, Norma's former co-worker who had fixed the basketball hoop in the driveway. Warren was very tall and thin with short brown hair and a mustache. And on this day, he was wearing a t-shirt and jeans. Warren told Fitzgerald in Paradise that he and Norma had kept in touch even after he had stopped working at the same retail store as her. He said Norma was one of the nicest people he'd ever met and that she always treated everyone around her like family. And so that was why so many people stayed close to her even after they moved away or they didn't work together anymore. Then Warren talked about the actual Memorial Day barbecue and said while he was there, he had fixed the basketball hoop and then at the end of the party, he had stayed back with a few people to help Norma clean up, and then he had just gone home, and that was it. Fitzgerald nodded and then asked Warren where he'd been the following night, the night that Norma was actually murdered. Warren shifted a bit in his seat and his face began to turn red. He said he was embarrassed, but he'd gone out to a club that night with some friends and he'd gotten really drunk and done a little cocaine. A look of surprise came across Fitzgerald's face, not at what Warren had done at the club, but that he was admitting to using hard drugs in front of a police officer. But Fitzgerald wasn't investigating cocaine use, so he asked Warren if he would take a polygraph and submit DNA samples. And Warren quickly agreed and immediately sat for the polygraph. He passed the test just like Anthony had, and later that day, when Fitzgerald and Paradise followed up with the friends Warren said he'd gone to the club with, they corroborated his alibi. <laughs> 
The investigation was only in its first week, but Fitzgerald was starting to worry they were already totally off track. They had no evidence tying anybody they'd interviewed to the crime scene, and everyone who had taken a polygraph test had passed. So, after the initial rush of the investigation, things started to slow down. Weeks went by and no new information or new leads came in, and Fitzgerald and Paradise, they kept digging, but nothing was panning out. Then, several weeks into the investigation, Fitzgerald got bad news from the forensics team. They had not been able to secure large enough DNA samples from the crime scene to effectively try to match it with DNA samples taken from Anthony and from Norma's friends who had gone to the cookout. So, without those DNA tests providing any help, Fitzgerald and Paradise scrambled to find a new way forward in this investigation. And then, a month after Norma's murder, they finally caught a break. One of Norma's sisters told Fitzgerald that she had found out a woman named Beatrice, who had been at that Memorial Day barbecue, was cheating on her husband. And Norma had given Beatrice an extra set of keys to her own house so Beatrice could meet this secret lover at Norma's house. The news that Norma's friend Beatrice was using Norma's house to carry out an affair got the murder investigation right back on track. And Fitzgerald wondered if maybe the keys that had been found on the floor next to Norma's body were the keys that Norma had given Beatrice. Fitzgerald had met with Beatrice early in the investigation when he was interviewing everybody who had been at Norma's cookout, but she hadn't said anything about an affair or the extra set of house keys. So when Fitzgerald met with Beatrice again at the station, he started his line of questioning by asking her why she had kept that information from police. Beatrice looked at Fitzgerald and her face turned red and her eyes started to water. She said she was totally ashamed and embarrassed that she was cheating on her husband and she was scared what would happen if her husband found out. After speaking to Beatrice for several more hours, Fitzgerald did not think she was the killer. But he thought Beatrice's husband could be the person they were looking for. Fitzgerald thought that Beatrice's husband probably did know that his wife was cheating on him. And so he could have potentially stolen Beatrice's extra set of keys to Norma's house and used them to storm into Norma's house to confront Norma about her role in his wife's affair and maybe in a fit of rage he had killed Norma. So after meeting with Beatrice, Fitzgerald sent officers to bring in Beatrice's husband. The man looked totally confused from the second he walked into the police station. He said he didn't know Norma that well and he really didn't understand how he could possibly help. But Fitzgerald led him into the interrogation room and took a seat across from him, and then, just point blank, Fitzgerald asked if he had gone to Norma's house to confront her because she was letting Beatrice use the house to have an affair. A look of complete shock came across Beatrice's husband's face. He stared at Fitzgerald and then said he had no idea his wife had been cheating on him. By the time the interview ended, Fitzgerald felt really bad. He figured the man deserved to know the truth about his wife, but no one should have to find out like that. And if Beatrice's husband had been faking his reaction to this news, Fitzgerald figured he had to be the best actor in the entire world, because the guy walked out of the police station looking like his entire life had just come crashing down. And so, after Beatrice and her husband could not be directly linked to Norma's murder, the investigation slowed down again. And after months, nobody close to Norma had failed a polygraph, there was still no help from any of the DNA tests, there was no concrete evidence that pointed to anybody in particular, and so the case just started to go cold. No matter how hard Fitzgerald and Paradise worked to move the investigation forward, they felt like they didn't have anywhere to go, and several more months passed with no new details coming in. People in the small city of Port Hunami started to get restless, and wild theories surfaced that Norma's murder was the work of a serial killer who staged his victims in dramatic ways. But that wild theory, or any other wild theory, never checked out. And then, one year passed after another, and Norma Rodriguez's murder started to fade from the media and from public discussion, and soon the police turned to other cases. But Detective Fitzgerald vowed he would keep working the case until Norma's killer was brought to justice. Fitzgerald had been almost 50 years old at the time of Norma's murder, and he promised Norma's sisters that he would not retire until the case was solved, no matter how old he got. So, by the time Fitzgerald was almost 60 years old, he was still working the case and trying to keep his promise to Norma's sisters. <laughs> 
Flash forward to May 31st, 2003, 10 years to the day after Norma's murder, and Fitzgerald was sitting in his office at the Port Hunami police station. Years earlier, he had put a photo of Norma on his desk to remind him of the promise he'd made to her sisters and also to help people remember that there was a real person whose life had been taken and who still deserved justice. Fitzgerald's phone suddenly rang, and so he answered it, and on the other line, someone from the state crime lab told Fitzgerald that they had news about the Norma Rodriguez case that he might not believe. Fitzgerald held his breath and listened. He learned that the crime lab had been following up on all these cold cases, and in doing that, they believed they had finally learned who had killed Norma. In the 10 years since Norma's murder, there had been major advances in DNA testing. So, in 2003, the DNA samples that had been taken from Norma's body were now, with all these advances, more than enough to find a match. The crime lab said they still needed to run new tests on the duct tape that was found on Norma to confirm their suspicions about her killer, but they would have those results soon. Fitzgerald hung up the phone and he wanted to cry. He had lived with Norma's case for a decade, and even he had started to doubt that he would ever be able to solve it. But just a few weeks after Fitzgerald got that big phone call, the crime lab confirmed their initial findings. So Fitzgerald picked up the phone and called one of Norma's sisters to let her know that Norma would finally be able to rest in peace, because he finally knew what had happened to her and who had done it. Based on DNA test results, evidence found at the scene, and interviews conducted throughout the 10-year investigation, here is a reconstruction of what police believe happened on May 31st, 1993, the day Norma Rodriguez was murdered. Just after midnight, the killer parked their car down the street from Norma's house. They picked up a roll of duct tape off the passenger seat and then stepped outside of their car into the dark summer night. The killer quickly scanned the nearby houses to make sure nobody was outside. When the killer was sure the area was clear, they moved quickly down the street, staying in the shadows and away from the streetlights. The killer was feeling angry and hurt and embarrassed, and they did not want to feel that way anymore. The killer crouched down low and moved quickly up the walkway to Norma's front door. They reached into their pocket, grabbed Norma's house keys, and unlocked the door and walked inside. The sound of laughter startled the killer, but they realized it was just coming from the TV, and they breathed a bit easier. The killer closed the front door behind them, put the keys back in their pocket, and walked into the living room. The sound from the TV got louder as they approached, and the killer saw Norma fast asleep on the couch. The killer stood there just for a second, watching her. Then they walked towards the couch and knelt down and put the duct tape on the floor. Then they lunged at Norma on the couch. Before Norma could even wake up, the killer had wrapped their hands around her throat and had begun strangling her. Norma's eyes opened wide and she gasped for breath. She flung her hands at the killer and tried to push them off. In the struggle, the killer kind of stumbled and Norma managed to fall off the couch onto the floor. She could barely breathe, but she tried to make it out of the living room to the kitchen. But the killer followed, grabbed her, and threw her on her back. Then the killer grabbed Norma's throat with both hands again and squeezed as hard as they could. Norma gasped and choked, and then her body stopped moving, and she went limp. The killer finally released their grip, and they looked down and saw very clearly Norma was dead. The killer then went back through the living room, grabbed the duct tape off the floor, and then returned to Norma's body. Then the killer unrolled a piece of tape, covered Norma's eyes with it, and then wrapped it around the rest of her head. But the killer didn't stop. They held Norma's head up and wrapped 20 feet of duct tape around her face and head 14 times. Finally, the killer ripped off the tape from the roll and let Norma's head fall to the floor. They reached into their pocket with their free hand, pulled out the house keys, and dropped them next to Norma's body. Then they ran back through the living room and opened the front door. They locked the door handle from the inside, then walked out of the house, closed the locked door behind them, and ran down the walkway with the roll of duct tape still in their hand. The same duct tape they had used to help prop up the rim on the basketball hoop in Norma's driveway. <laughs> 
Warren Mackey, Norma's former co-worker who had been at the Memorial Day cookout, had murdered Norma. It would turn out that Warren had wanted to be more than just friends with Norma, and for a while, he thought that was a real possibility. Norma and Warren talked on the phone regularly, and he even spent time at her house with her and the kids. But Norma just did not want a romantic relationship with Warren. And every time he asked her out or made a move on her at her house, she turned him down. Finally, Warren decided he just couldn't handle the rejection or the embarrassment he felt, so he decided he would murder Norma. At the Memorial Day cookout, while Norma walked around talking to her guests, Warren had gone into the house, found Norma's purse, and stolen her keys. It would turn out Norma had actually complained to a friend at the cookout that she had apparently misplaced her house keys somewhere. Then, late the following night, Warren had returned to Norma's house. He knew she slept on the couch a lot, so he figured he would either find her there or in her bedroom. It's not known if Warren had always intended to use the duct tape to wrap up Norma's face, or if he had decided to do it just because after he had killed her, he couldn't stand looking at her face and kind of seeing what he had done, and so he had just kind of impulsively decided to wrap her up. Following the murder, Warren had quickly gone home and then headed out late that night to the club with his friends to give himself a possible alibi. But the duct tape found on Norma ultimately discredited that alibi and led authorities to Warren after the investigation had stalled for 10 years. In 2003, the crime lab discovered that DNA samples that had been taken from Norma's hands matched the samples provided by Warren when he had submitted to DNA testing. But the crime lab and the district attorney believed it could be argued that Warren's DNA was found on Norma's hands because they had recently spent time together at a party. So tests were run on the part of the duct tape that had been torn away from the rest of the roll, the part of the duct tape that only the killer would have touched. And when DNA samples from the duct tape matched Warren's DNA, authorities knew they had found Norma's killer. Some investigators came to believe that Warren was able to pass his polygraph test because he possessed certain traits often linked to narcissists and sociopaths. Things like a lack of remorse about lying and the ability to create a totally alternate reality in your mind that actually feels like the truth when you're talking about it. And so those traits can obviously make it easier for some people to pass a lie detector test even though they're lying. But regardless of how he passed that polygraph, Warren could not outrun the DNA evidence forever. And once the duct tape test confirmed he was the killer, police arrested him for Norma's murder. When Warren was confronted with the DNA evidence, he pled guilty to second-degree murder and he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. As of fall of 2023, he is still in prison in California. At Warren's sentencing, one of Norma's sisters looked him in the eye and told him, quote, I curse you for the rest of your life. You didn't just do this to my sister. You murdered all of us. End quote. The state of Iowa is known as the corn capital of the world. But Iowa's three million residents do a lot more than produce billions of bushels of corn every year. They also personify some of the best qualities that America has to offer. Located in the Midwestern part of the country and surrounded by two rivers and six other states, the people of Iowa take pride in being friendly, considerate, law-abiding, hardworking, and just plain nice. The state is one of the safest in the country, and every year, national surveys show that Iowa residents are among the most polite Americans you will ever meet. And if there's one place in Iowa where you are guaranteed to be treated, quote, Iowa nice, it's the little town in the southwest corner of the state called Shenandoah. At one time, Shenandoah was considered the seed and nursery capital of the entire world. They no longer hold that title, but residents of this town are still surrounded by some of the most beautiful flowers and trees on the planet, along with some of the best tasting fruits and vegetables. And back in 1988, if there was one person in Shenandoah who absolutely embodied the town's spirit of friendliness, hospitality, and local pride, it was 39-year-old Cindy Borton. If you were a visitor to Shenandoah back in the late 1980s, 
Cindy would be one of the first people to run right up to you to introduce herself and offer you directions or recommendations of where to go in her little town. And if you were one of Cindy's friends or neighbors, she would drop anything she was doing to help you, and it didn't matter if it was day or night. Unlike many of the town's 5,500 residents whose family had been living in the town for generations, Cindy and her husband Robert and their son John had moved to Shenandoah later in life. Cindy was born on May 22, 1949, in another small Iowa town called Garwin that was located three and a half hours to the northeast of Shenandoah. There, she and her brother had grown up playing outside and helping their parents with daily chores. After high school, Cindy went to work at a local restaurant, which is where she met her future husband, Robert. He had grown up in another Iowa town about 30 minutes away from her. Robert was a stocky young man with horn-rimmed glasses and brown hair that he swept back from his receding hairline, and when he met Cindy, he was instantly charmed by the smiling and laughing waitress with thick dark hair and shining eyes. A year after meeting, Cindy and Robert got married, and one year after that, they welcomed their first and only child, a baby boy named John. Early on in their marriage, Robert enlisted in the U.S. Navy, and so he was gone a lot of the time. As a result, Cindy stepped up and became the anchor of the family, always putting the needs of her husband and her son over her own. She also began working multiple part-time jobs to supplement Robert's military income, which was just not that much. However, she only took jobs that did not interfere with her ability to spend quality time with her son, John. In 1977, after Robert left the military, the Bortons moved to a town in Illinois called Evanston. There, Robert enrolled in a private seminary so that he could fulfill his lifelong dream of becoming an ordained pastor. In 1981, Robert graduated from the seminary, and a year later, he got an offer from a little church in Shenandoah asking him to come be their pastor. Robert and Cindy were thrilled, and so after Robert accepted the offer, the little family packed up their belongings and then made the eight-hour trip west back to their home state of Iowa and into the pretty little town of Shenandoah. Once in Shenandoah, Cindy immediately threw herself into her new role as the pastor's wife. She was naturally outgoing and empathetic, and so she pretty much instantly became a favorite, not just with Robert's congregation, but with the rest of the town as well. Even though Robert had landed his dream job, it was not a high-paying job, and so like Cindy, he needed to go out and pick up some extra work to make ends meet. Robert would get a part-time job at a car dealership where he washed and cleaned cars, and Cindy, after arriving in Shenandoah, worked as many as three part-time jobs, including her main one at a donut shop. But despite how much Cindy and Robert were forced to work every week, they were very happy people. In fact, when most people described Cindy when she was living in Shenandoah, they would talk about her laughter, because one, she seemed to always be laughing and smiling, and two, because her laughter was incredibly infectious, and anyone who heard it couldn't help but laugh themselves. But the Bortons' seemingly perfect life would go off the rails in 1987, five years after the Bortons had arrived in Shenandoah. That summer, Robert's church, which had been struggling financially for years, was finally forced to shut their doors, and so Robert's job was gone, and so too was his main source of income. This loss was devastating both emotionally and financially for the Borton family. By September of the following year, 1988, Robert had not had any luck finding another pastor gig in town or nearby, and the income they were making between Robert's car dealership work and Cindy's various part-time jobs was just not enough, and so the couple began talking about relocating. However, they both loved Shenandoah, it was their home, and John, who was 18 at the time, he was about to start his senior year in high school, and so they really didn't want to pull him out until he was done. And so Cindy and Robert decided that they would just stay in Shenandoah and they would weather the financial storm they were in, and then maybe after John graduated from high school, they would think about moving. But when John's senior year actually began that September, the Borton's 18-year-old son suddenly developed a serious case of senioritis, meaning he didn't want to go to school. And on the morning of Tuesday, September 6th, just a few days into the new school year, John walked into the family kitchen and announced to his mother that he did not want to go to school, ever. 
Cindy had to argue with John all by herself because Robert had already left that morning for work. But luckily, John eventually just gave up because he knew his mother was not going to budge. She wanted him to go to school. And so begrudgingly, John ate his breakfast, he gathered up his backpack, and he followed his mother out to her car that was parked in the driveway. On the drive to school, Cindy reminded her son that she'd be working at the donut shop that afternoon, and so he'd have to walk home. When they arrived at Shenandoah High School a few minutes later, John, who was still very annoyed with his mother for forcing him to go to school that day, he got out and he slammed the car door before mumbling a barely audible goodbye to his mother. As Cindy drove the short distance back to their house, she tried to tell herself that, you know, John's behavior was just typical teenage behavior, and once the school year really got going, John's attitude would surely improve. Still, it was something she intended to talk to Robert about when he came home that afternoon for his lunch break. Once Cindy was back at their home, she parked the car in the driveway and walked through the back door and down the short hallway into the kitchen. After cleaning up the breakfast dishes, she caught up on a few household chores and made sure that the clothes she planned to wear to work that afternoon were clean and ready to go. Then she glanced at her watch and headed back into the kitchen to heat up some spaghetti sauce and pasta for lunch with Robert. Right at 12 p.m. that afternoon, just a half mile away, Robert would tell his boss that he was headed home for his one-hour-long lunch break. A few minutes later, Robert pulled his pickup truck into the driveway of his modest little house, he turned off the engine, and he walked up the steps to the front door. As he stepped into their small living room, he called out to let Cindy know that he was home. After she called back to him from the kitchen, Robert went to the first floor bathroom to wash up before he too headed into the kitchen to join his wife. As Cindy served him a hot plate of spaghetti, Robert listened as Cindy told him about how John had not wanted to go to school that morning and how upset he was when she dropped him off. And Robert would agree with his wife that, you know, this did seem like typical teenage behavior and that, yeah, probably as the school year wore on, his attitude would change. The pair would chat about John's behavior for the bulk of their meal. And then at about 1245, Robert put his dishes in the sink. He thanked Cindy for his lunch. And then he told her he'd see her that afternoon after she got home from her shift at the donut shop. A few minutes after Robert had left the house to return to work, Cindy was already washing the lunch dishes when she heard a knock on the back door. She glanced at her watch and wondered who would be visiting her in the middle of the day. A little over an hour later, at around 2 p.m., Robert received a call at the car dealership where he worked. When his boss handed him the phone, Robert heard the voice of Cindy's co-worker at the donut shop. Sue Rogers told him that Cindy had not shown up for work which was unlike her since she usually arrived for her shift early. Sue had tried calling the Borton house, but no one had picked up. Robert told Sue that, you know, maybe Cindy had taken a nap after lunch and she's just overslept. An hour later, at 3 p.m., Robert got another call from the donut shop. This time, Sue sounded worried. Cindy still had not shown up for work, and a co-worker who went by the Borton house had stopped at the back door to call out for Cindy, but didn't get an answer and they noticed that the door was open. But this co-worker didn't want to go inside without being invited, and so they left. Robert called home, and when Cindy did not pick up the phone, he asked his boss if he could leave work to go check on his wife. Just after 3.30 p.m., Robert pulled up to his house, and the first thing he noticed was that Cindy's car was still in the driveway. After parking his truck just behind her car, Robert walked up to the front door and let himself in, calling out his wife's name as soon as he stepped inside. When there was no answer, Robert began walking from the living room where he came in at the front of the house toward the back of the house where the kitchen was. As he walked, he kept yelling out for Cindy, but it was silent. When Robert finally reached the kitchen and got a view of the kitchen, he came to a complete and sudden stop. Backing slowly away, Robert reached for a nearby phone on the wall, and he called 911. When they picked up, he would tell police to come to his house right away because his wife had had a terrible accident. After hanging up the phone, Robert grabbed the family dog's collar off of a nearby hook, and he put it on the dog and led the dog outside to the backyard where he tied the dog up, and then Robert walked around the outside of the house to the driveway in front, where he leaned against the side of Cindy's car, and there he waited patiently for the police to arrive. When the local police and ambulance arrived at the Borton house a few minutes later, Robert stepped forward to meet them. Then he stayed outside while the police and the medical technicians entered the front door and made their way into the kitchen and back. 
What they saw inside was so shocking and so gruesome that the chief of police, Richard Hunt, he knew this was not a crime or a crime scene that his local police force could handle. He needed serious help from the state, and he needed that help right away. The kitchen was covered in blood, and lying on her back in the middle of the floor was Cindy Borden. She had been stabbed 29 times with various bloody weapons that were found near her body on the ground. Based on the sheer violence of the attack and the fact that the back door had been unlocked and undamaged, Chief Hunt was sure that this crime had been personal. He knew the crime statistics in Iowa. 85% of all homicides in the state were committed by people and family members who were close to the victim. Which meant that right away, Cindy's husband, Robert, and her son, John, were at the top of the list of potential suspects. And so as Chief Hunt and the rest of the local police force more or less waited for the state law enforcement to arrive so they could actually begin processing the scene, Chief Hunt decided to just go outside and speak with Robert. And so he went outside, he walked down the front steps, and he made his way over to Robert, who was still near Cindy's car, and Chief Hunt would ask him, Robert, do you have any idea who could have done this to your wife? After Robert said, no, he didn't, the police chief was shocked when Cindy's husband went on to insist that his wife's death must have been an accident. But before the chief could continue questioning Robert, they were interrupted by the arrival of the Borton family's son, John, who was walking down the road towards the family house on his way home from school. John slowed down as he approached the house and took in the sight of the police cars and an ambulance parked along the curb and the yellow crime scene tape along the perimeter of their yard. When John reached his father, Robert told him that something bad had happened to his mother and that she was dead. But as Robert reached out to put his hands on his son's shoulders, John dropped his backpack and just turned around and started running. Later, he would tell law enforcement that the news was so shocking he just couldn't handle it, and so that's why he ran. When John did return to his house almost two hours later, personnel from the state's Division of Criminal Investigation had finally arrived, and they were dusting for fingerprints and gathering evidence inside of the Borden house. And local law enforcement had fanned out around the neighborhood to ask the Borden's neighbors if they had seen anything unusual or suspicious that day. By then, Robert had also told police exactly what he had done that day, starting with him leaving the house at 6.45 a.m. to go to work, and then arriving at work at 7 a.m., and then coming home again at noon for lunch with Cindy, and then leaving again and getting back to the car dealership at 1 p.m. Robert also described the calls he got from the donut shop, saying that Cindy had not shown up for her 2 p.m. shift, and he would describe to police what it was like when he arrived at his house at 3.30 p.m. to check to see if Cindy was okay. After John was back at the house, he would tell police that he had been at school from the time his mother had dropped him off in the morning until school let out at 3.30, and then he had walked home. When the state investigators asked John if anything about that morning had seemed out of the ordinary, at first, John said no, but then after a few seconds, he changed his answer to yes. He said that he and his mother had been arguing that morning because John didn't want to go to school that day, but he told police this was not anything serious. By the time John and Robert left the Borton property to go stay that night with friends that they knew from Robert's old church, word had spread throughout Shenandoah that something unspeakable had happened to one of the town's most popular residents. Early the next morning on September 7th, there were police officers waiting at Robert's car dealership to check on Robert's alibi. And while Robert's timesheet confirmed the timeline Robert had given them, Robert's boss added one detail about that day that Robert had left out. When Robert arrived back at the dealership after his lunch break, he had apparently changed his clothes. When asked if that was unusual, his boss would say, not really. Robert's boss would say that on Tuesdays, the car dealership's commercial cleaning service would come by to pick up dirty uniforms and rags, and so Robert's boss thought that, you know, maybe Robert had come to work that day in his work clothes, he had gotten a full morning of work in, and then when he went home for lunch, he had changed, and then when he had come back, maybe he had dropped off those dirty clothes from the morning with the cleaning service. 
While this seemed totally plausible, investigators couldn't help but think that if Robert was involved in the murder of his wife, and if there was any evidence from the murder on those work clothes, well, that evidence was now being destroyed by a commercial washing machine. Meanwhile, investigators who had arrived at Shenandoah High School early that morning to check John's alibi also had some questions. It would turn out John's alibi was not as straightforward as he had made it seem. His teachers at his high school told police that yes, John had come to school the previous day, but he did not have any classes between 1 and 3 p.m., and no one could really verify his whereabouts at that time. And it just so happens that that was likely the time frame when his mother was killed. And later that afternoon, a neighbor would tell police that they had seen a teenager running through the Borton's backyard around the time that Cindy would have been killed. The neighbor couldn't give police much of a description of this teenager, except to say that the teenager was a boy and that he had a thin build and it looked like his hair was brown, which was basically a perfect description of John. And so, two days after Cindy's death, detectives brought John into the police station for questioning. When pressed about the 1 to 3 p.m. gap in his alibi, John would adamantly state that he never left school grounds during that time period. He said he had been at school all day from the time his mother dropped him off until he walked home and discovered the police and ambulances in front of his house. When asked about his parents' relationship, John admitted that there was some tension there and that sometimes he heard his parents arguing mostly about money. But John also told police that his mother and father were very committed to each other and had been quite happy in the past. And so no matter what problems they might be having, John was confident that his parents were not even close to getting divorced. He believed they would look to find a solution that kept them together. As for his own relationship with his mother, John told police that his mother had been everything to him and that it totally crushed him that his last interaction with her was that stupid fight about him not wanting to go to school. Despite Robert and John continuing to deny that they had anything to do with the murder, 48 hours into the investigation, the father and son were still the prime suspects. Three days after Cindy's murder, on September 9th, the results of her autopsy came back. Based on the fact that the spaghetti she had eaten for lunch on the day of her murder was completely undigested, police were able to narrow the time of her death down to about 1 p.m. Meanwhile, investigators questioning teachers and students at Shenandoah High School were starting to believe that John had been telling the truth, that he really had been on school grounds on the day of the murder from 1 to 3 p.m. At Cindy's memorial service on September 13th, six days after her murder, investigators were waiting outside the church. Before scratching John off of their suspect list, they wanted to talk with John's best friend, Jim Bettis, to see if he could offer any additional insights into John's relationship with his mother. Jim had been a frequent visitor at the Borton household, and since Cindy's death, he had been spending a lot of time with John, comforting him. And so police were hopeful that if John was involved, you know, maybe Jim would have picked up on it and maybe Jim would be willing to talk about it. But according to Jim, there really were no problems between John and his mother. He said John loved his mother and that he would never hurt her. And as for that fight that they got in over John going to school or not that morning, Jim said that was totally insignificant and not a reflection of John and Cindy's actual relationship. After speaking with Jim and a few other friends of John's that came out of the memorial service, investigators felt satisfied that John really was not involved, and so they crossed his name off the suspect list. So with no other new leads, and no further information on any teenager running across the Borton's yard on the afternoon of the murder, investigators were now sure that the killer had to be Cindy's husband, Robert. So, about one week after the murder, investigators brought Robert into the interrogation room in the basement of the local police station, and then once he was sitting down, a special agent from the state's division of criminal investigation leaned in close to Robert and said, Bob, let's quit playing games. We both know Cindy was dead when you went back to work. But for the next three hours, Robert, who showed very little emotion and no signs of grief, refused to change his story. He said he had nothing to do with his wife's murder. 
He said that Cindy had seemed totally normal when he left for work early on the morning of the day she died, and when he came home for lunch that day at noon, she was alive. And she was also still alive when he left to go back to work at 12.45 p.m. Before leaving the police station, Robert agreed to have his fingerprints collected, and he agreed to take a lie detector test. So, the very next day, a special agent drove Robert 150 miles northeast to Des Moines, where Robert was hooked up to a polygraph machine that would measure his physical reactions to a series of key questions. Questions like, did you hurt your wife? Or, did you kill your wife? And Robert would answer these questions the same way he had the day before in the basement interrogation room at the police station. No, I didn't hurt my wife. No, I didn't kill my wife. But this time, the polygraph machine showed that Robert was not being truthful. He didn't fail his test by much, but the results convinced investigators that despite Robert's denials, he must be the killer. And so the agent who had administered the lie detector test pulled Robert aside for another round of intense questioning, telling him, hey, you failed this test, so you got to tell us the truth now. But Robert continued to say that he had nothing to do with it, and he even fell asleep during this interrogation. Even with this failed lie detector test, the police lacked hard evidence that linked Robert to the murder. And so even though they wanted to keep him, they couldn't. They had to let him go. And so a special agent drove Robert back to Shenandoah, and on the drive, he turned to Robert and he said, You know, Bob, when this is all over and you've been arrested, charged, tried, and convicted, I would be honored if you confessed to me. But a week later, two and a half weeks after Cindy's murder, investigators got another piece of bad news when the state's crime lab reported that they had not been able to lift any fingerprints from the various murder weapons that had been found in Cindy's kitchen. They also were unable to pull any prints off of any other physical evidence that had been sent off for testing. As September inched towards October, and police had still not made any arrests, the residents of Shenandoah were outraged and scared. Every day, they called the police station and the mayor's office seeking updates, and local gun stores reported a serious uptick in sales. And in November, Robert, who was being questioned by police nearly every day, and was being shunned by residents who now walked across the street to avoid talking with him, he packed up the family's belongings and moved with John to the town of Gladbrook, just outside of Des Moines, where he and Cindy had actually gotten married. Around this time, local reporters began asking the question that was on everyone's mind. How was it possible that in a town as small as Shenandoah, police could not figure out who had committed such a heinous crime? And on top of having a murderer on the loose, Shenandoah also had an arsonist on the loose. Around the time Cindy was killed, someone had been intentionally setting fires around town, damaging an elementary school, as well as destroying a pickup truck. And while the arson attacks didn't appear to be connected to Cindy's murder, it did seem odd that there would be two violent crimes happening at the same time in a town that saw almost zero violent crime. And so some investigators began to suspect, just because of the rarity of violent crime, that the arson attacks and the murder had to be connected. And on November 30th of that year, their suspicions seemed to be confirmed. On that day, there was an arson attack at Shenandoah City Hall, except this time, the arsonist left behind a note. On this note, the arsonist warned police that the school fire and the truck fire and the murder of Cindy Borton were nothing compared to what was coming next. At the end of this note, the arsonist identified themselves as, quote, the Night Stalker. The Night Stalker was the name of a notorious murderer in California who had been captured three years earlier. But what really caught the attention of law enforcement was the fact that whoever had signed the note also left behind a fingerprint at the very bottom of the piece of paper the note was written on. While investigators waited on the results of the fingerprint analysis, they returned to the scenes of the earlier arson attacks, and on a bridge near the school fire, police had found the letters NS painted on a concrete support. They believed these had to be the initials of the Night Stalker. 
By early December, the mayor of Shenandoah had received more than 200 calls from terrified residents demanding that the police find the arsonist slash killer before they murdered anyone else. But the Night Stalker lead came to an abrupt end a few weeks later when the fingerprint analysis not only failed to match Richard Borton's fingerprints, it didn't match any prints on file in any local, state, or federal law enforcement database. So unfortunately, both the arson cases and the murder case began to grow cold. It wasn't until five months after Cindy Borton's murder that local and state investigators would get the tip they needed to break the murder and arson cases wide open. Around dinner time on the cloudy, cool night of January 30th, 1989, the Shenandoah police chief, Richard Hunt, got a call from one of his officers. There was a teenager who had just walked into the police station and he wanted to talk with someone about the murder of Cindy Borton. A few minutes later, Chief Hunt was sitting in his office looking across his desk at 18-year-old Jack Johnson, one of John Borton's best friends and classmates, and one of the boys investigators had talked with back in September when they were confirming John's alibi for the time of his mother's murder. Jack told Chief Hunt that a few days earlier, on January 26th, Jack had been talking to someone, and during their conversation, Jack had asked this person what was the worst thing they had ever done. And this person paused for a moment, and then they said to Jack, I've done something that I'm pretty sure God will never forgive me for. Jack would go on to tell police all the awful details of what this person claimed to have done that God would not forgive them for. Based on Jack's testimony, this is a reconstruction of what really happened to Cindy Borden. Back on the day that Cindy died, September 6th, 1988, she and her husband Robert were sitting in the kitchen eating spaghetti and talking about their son's recent bad behavior. After Robert was done eating, he put his dirty dishes in the sink, he thanked his wife for the food, and then he headed out the door to go back to work. As Cindy began washing the dishes, she heard a knock on the back door. Glancing at her watch, she saw it was already almost 1 p.m., which meant she didn't really have a lot of time to visit with whoever this was before she had to step away and get ready for her 2 p.m. shift at the donut shop. And so feeling a little bit flustered, Cindy turned off the faucet and she dried her hands, and then she walked around the counter and she walked down the very short hallway that led to the back door of the house. And as she walked down this hallway, she looked through the glass of the back door and she saw who her visitor was. And even though she was pressed for time, she couldn't help herself. She smiled. She was happy to see him. However, she was a little bit concerned that her visitor was not in school. But she opened the door and as soon as the door was open, her visitor immediately reassured her that he understood he was supposed to be in school and he'd be there soon. He was just stopping by because he was hoping that Cindy wouldn't mind being a reference for a job that he was going to be applying for. And so Cindy said, yeah, of course I'll be a reference for your new job. I'd love to hear about your new job. Come inside. Let's talk about it. And so her visitor stepped inside, and as they walked down the little hallway towards the kitchen, the visitor asked Cindy if it was okay if she got him a glass of water because he was really thirsty. And so Cindy said, yeah, no problem. Come in the kitchen. I'll get you water, and we can talk about this new job. And so they start walking down this hallway, and the visitor reaches into his pocket, and he unfolds his pocket knife. And right as Cindy is stepping into the kitchen with her back to him, he walks up behind her, he reaches around the front of her neck, and he digs the blade into the front of her throat, cutting her neck wide open. Cindy instinctively reached up and tried to grab her neck to protect herself, but her attacker grabbed her hands, pulled them away, and then with the knife, he dug another trench across her throat. And then the attacker backed up a couple of steps. Cindy, who was now pouring blood out of her neck, stumbled forward into the kitchen, and then she whipped around, clutching her throat, looking at her attacker. It was 18-year-old Jim Bettis, her son's best friend. But she didn't have time to process who was attacking her, because before long, as she was staring at him, he lunged at her again, slashing and cutting her. And so she put her hands up over her face to protect herself, and he was digging the knife over and over again into her forearms and her hands and all over her body. And eventually, she kind of slumped onto the kitchen counter after being stabbed and cut so many times, at which point, Jim walked away from her, and he walked over to a drawer that he knew from all of the visits he had made to this household to visit with John. He knew that in this drawer were kitchen knives and other utensils. And so as Cindy is laying right near him up against the 
counter pleading with him to stop and she's bleeding everywhere. He reaches into this drawer and he pulls out two of Cindy's sharpest knives and he sets them on the counter and then he pulls out two long serving forks that each had very pointed prongs at the end. And so he turns around to look at Cindy and Cindy sees what he's doing and so she tries to make a run for the phone to call 911. But before she could get there, Jim grabbed the two knives that he had just taken out of the drawer and he leapt in front of Cindy and began stabbing her over and over and over again on her sides, her front, her face, her hands, her legs, anywhere he could, he would stab her. And Cindy the whole time is trying to hit him and push him back, but there's nothing she can do. She's helpless. And then at some point, she kind of falls to the ground, but she's not dead yet. And so at that point, Jim put down the two knives he had just taken out of that drawer, and he went back and he got the two serving forks. And then he went back over to Cindy, who was now crawling across the ground, trying to get to the phone. And he began stabbing her in the back, in the back of the neck, on the side, over and over and over again. Despite multiple puncture wounds to her vital organs, Cindy was not dying. She was bleeding profusely. She was likely mortally wounded at this point. But she kept trying to move forward. She kept trying to fight back. She was doing anything she could to save herself. But eventually, Jim overpowered her. He flipped her over onto her back. And then kneeling next to her, he got his tools lined up next to him, the two knives, his own knife, and the two serving forks. And systematically, he began using these tools to begin cutting and slashing and digging into the front of her torso. And he would continue to do that until Cindy finally stopped moving. And when she did stop moving, he picked up one of the serving forks, he raised it up over his head, and then he brought it straight down into her neck, plunging it deep inside of her. And then he let go of the handle, leaving the fork stuck into her neck. Then he wiped off the handle of that fork, as well as the other handles of the other murder weapons, which he just left on the floor next to Cindy, with the exception of his folding knife, he would take that. Then Jim stood up and walked into the small bathroom near the kitchen, and he washed his hands and face, leaving faint traces of blood in the sink, but wiping his fingerprints from the faucet handles. Then Jim retraced his steps to the back door, he stepped outside, and he paused for just a minute before taking off at a run across the Borton's yard. He would be seen by that neighbor, except the neighbor would only be able to describe him as a thin teenager with brown hair. Three hours later, Jim and his parents would be out driving around when they passed John, who had just bolted from the scene and the news of his mother's death. Jim's parents slowed the car down, and Jim leaned out the window, and he comforted his friend, asking him if he wanted to come into the car and talk about what happened, you know, did he need a ride anywhere? But John, who was in a state of shock, would just shake his head and keep on running. Five months after killing his best friend's mother, Jim would confess his crime to his other best friend, Jack Johnson. Not only would Jim tell Jack exactly where he had disposed of his pocket knife, he would also draw a diagram for Jack showing him exactly where Jim had left Cindy's body inside the Borton's kitchen. On the night of January 30th, which was the day that Jack Johnson had gone to police to tell them about Jim, he presented Jim's hand-drawn diagram and pushed it across the desk to Chief Hunt. On February 2nd, 1989, police asked Jim Bettis to come to the police station for an interview. Once inside the interrogation room, Jim denied everything, saying he had never had that conversation with Jack Johnson. But after agreeing to let police collect his fingerprints, police determined Jim's prints matched the one found on the note left by the Night Stalker. After another round of questioning, Jim eventually admitted to being the arsonist, but it wasn't until he conclusively and massively failed his polygraph test that he would admit to police that, yes, he had killed Cindy Bort. It would turn out Jim had nothing against Cindy. The person he really hated was his own father. According to Jim, his father had spent years deriding and criticizing him. For a while, Jim had taken out his anger by setting fires around town, but for the last several months, he'd come to despise his father so much that all Jim could think about was killing him. But Jim was afraid of his father and couldn't really imagine himself besting his father in any kind of physical confrontation. And Jim wasn't even sure he could go through with killing anyone. So he decided what he needed to do was practice. He needed to find someone who would be easy to kill, someone vulnerable, someone who trusted him, someone who loved him. And the one person who fit that bill 
was his best friend's mother, Cindy Borton. As far back as Jim could remember, Cindy had been the one person he knew who was always glad to see him and who always had time to talk with him and who always offered him encouragement. She would be the last person to suspect that he could ever hurt her. And so he told himself if he could kill Cindy, maybe he could also kill his father. The police were able to finally prove their case against Jim when they found his pocket knife that he had tossed under a local bridge. The knife still had Cindy's blood on it, along with Jim's fingerprints. On November 13th, 1989, Jim Bettis, who was 19 years old at the time, was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. In a letter Jim wrote from prison, he told a relative that when he, quote, killed that lady, I guess I went too far and pretended that she was my dad. By 1990, two years after Cindy's murder, Robert and John had moved again, this time to Eldora, Iowa, a town of 3,000 residents located about three and a half hours northeast of Shenandoah. Robert would remarry, and he would find work at a plastics recycling plant. State and local law enforcement in Shenandoah defended the intensive investigation techniques they used with Robert, saying that from the start, he was their only viable suspect. Now 52 years old, Cindy's son John wants people to remember his mother for her life, not her death. He would tell reporters in April of 2022 that she was a wonderful, wonderful person and I only miss her on days that end in the letter Y. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast with exclusive episode. If you enjoyed today's stories and you're looking for more bone chilling content, be sure to check out all of our studio's podcasts, Mr. Ballin Medical Mysteries Bedtime Stories. Just search for Ballin Studios wherever you get your podcasts and you'll find them all. Also, there are hundreds more stories like the ones you heard today, but in video format on our YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. I really appreciate your support until next time. See you.